look, this is a very important event. It's an important event at a critical time. Um, it's, it's, the date was chosen uh, for a reason. Um, we're halfway between uh, COP26, uh, the end of COP26 and the start of COP27. We're in the midpoint of your uh, term. Um, and we are almost a quarter of the way through uh, this decisive decade. Um, decade of delivery for uh, net zero, uh, the net zero transition. Um, I think this room particularly understands the scale of the challenge. Um, the average temperature is already 1.1 degrees um, warmer than pre-industrial levels. Last seven years have been the warmest on record. Um, and while the commitments, and I'm one of those who believe um, uh, there were great successes uh, in Glasgow, uh, the commitments of governments uh, that were made there could limit warming to 1.8 degrees. Um, their policies are still only consistent with warming of 2.7 degrees. Um, so there is a gap. We must mine this gap, not just mine this gap, but uh, urgently close uh, the gap. Uh, because as the IPCC has set out, uh, our global carbon budget is a binding constraint um, that is on course to be exhausted this decade. Now, transitioning to net zero as rapidly as necessary and as smoothly as possible requires wholesale transformations of our economies and our financial system. And as the Lord Mayor just pointed out, and we're all living, uh, this is against the backdrop of uh, terrible geopolitics and a worsening uh, global economy. But I suggest that recent events put into sharp relief the many, and there are many, failings of the global energy system today. Energy is a weapon in a horrific and unjust war. Households in developed economies are facing crippling energy bills. And across the developing world, the grind of energy poverty is worsening. And all the while, the climate crisis grows, building future costs that will dwarf current hardships. In short, our current energy system is unreliable, it's unaffordable, inaccessible, and unsustainable. And we need to move rapidly to a new one that supports both climate stability and an inclusive, thriving economy. And to get there, we will need nothing short of a revolution in that energy system uh, in business and in finance. And at the 11th hour, that revolution has begun. Over the past two years, the proportion of global emissions covered by country net zero targets, the ones I alluded to earlier, has risen from less than a third to uh, just under 90 percent. Under the Glasgow Climate Pact, countries agreed to close the gap between ambition and action, and that will be a key objective uh, when we meet in Sharm el-Sheikh. For the first time in Glasgow, over 100 nations agreed to stop illegal deforestation, um, and to phase down uh, fewer than 100 nations, unfortunately, but a significant number of uh, nations uh, committed um, to phase down unabated coal and inefficient subsidies uh, for fossil fuels. 1.5 is still alive, although, as Alec Sharma has said, uh, just. Now, for the world to get to its objectives, we need a sustainable revolution that is on the scale of the Industrial Revolution but at the pace of the digital transformation. The energy we use to keep our lights on, to heat our homes, uh, to transport our goods, to fuel production, uh, accounts for fully 75% of final uh, direct emissions. These emissions must fall rapidly uh, to have any chance of keeping that one and a half degrees alive. And this is going to be difficult because we can't simply decree a complex energy transition by fiat. We have to transition both supply and demand. And how we do so matters tremendously for stagflationary pressures and social costs. Recent IMF simulations indicate that an exclusive focus on either the supply side or the demand side could mean the difference of $170 per barrel of oil. Solely restricting hydrocarbon supply will boost the rents of the energy sector while constraining governments and hobbling households. In contrast, focusing on demand and increasing clean energy supply will boost household incomes, employment and growth. Adjustment can then be concentrated in declining industries and can be smoothed by governments that are in much more robust financial.
financial health. Now, addressing energy supply in the current conjuncture uh, appears at first glance particularly challenging. European energy markets have ruptured with negative spillovers around the globe. The resulting scramble for alternatives is boosting emissions uh, to tackle, uh, boosting emissions in the near term uh, and leading some, as the Lord Mayor just mentioned, some to argue to temporarily set aside uh, our climate goals. But we know the climate doesn't care why emissions happen, only how much uh, occur. The more we emit now, the more radical action will be needed later. We need to speed up, not slow down. And more fundamentally, there is no energy security without sustainability. The folly of our lean, fossil fuel-based global energy system has once again been laid bare. In contrast, once built, clean energy systems are more affordable, more efficient, resilient, and reliable. No one owns the wind or the sun, and hydrogen is literally everywhere. Now, the reality is that while the installed base of clean energy is growing rapidly, the pace of this investment needs to triple uh, this decade. It's crucial that governments incentivize faster investment to secure uh, both energy security and that energy sustainability. And there are some signs of progress in recent weeks. The UK's energy security strategy targets make offshore wind the leading uh, source of energy, will make offshore wind the leading source of energy uh, generation, electricity generation, I should say, in the country as early as next year. Well, the EU's Repower EU plan seeks a 20% increase in wind and solar deployment this year alone. And both the EU and the UK have more than doubled their targets for clean hydrogen by the end of this decade um, and plan a tripling of solar and wind power over the same time horizon. Now, there's no escaping that a smooth energy transition will require some limited and targeted investment in fossil fuels. That's because declining production of existing fields means that some capacity must be rebuilt even while overall use of fossil fuels falls. And there's value in shifting to less carbon intensive sources. In addition, Russia's war underscores that a resilient system needs more diversified and reliable suppliers. The price, um, the price of greater security of supply in the near term will be more stranded assets over the medium term. Now, the one and a half degree aligned pathways of the IEA and the IPCC imply between 400 and 600 billion dollars of annual fossil fuels related investment every year this decade. Although that's roughly the level of current financing, this doesn't mean the world is on track. In fact, we urgently need a more granular breakdown of the use of proceeds of new fossil fuel financing across expansion, replacement, and reduction. GFANS is ready to work with others to develop exactly this. And in, par in parallel, governments must set the right incentives so that the expected life of every new project is consistent with the transition. Now, I spoke a moment ago about the Industrial Revolution, and it was made possible by a financial revolution centered in this city uh, that transformed the nature of private financial intermediation. It changed the focus of central banking and the scope of the international monetary system. And the net zero revolution requires changes of finance that are at least as bold. The rise of fractional reserve banking in the 19th century made possible the, provi was made possible the provision of the enormous amount of capital that was required to build the factories and develop the new energy sources at that time to power them. Central banks became lenders of last resort to provide necessary stability to that new system. And a new international monetary system, based on the gold standard and centered literally right here in the city, enabled the free flow of capital um, to power the world. 
What that revolution in finance brought was greater maturity transformation and increased financial leverage at the heart of the system. To finance our sustainable revolution, we need to bring faster net zero transition and reduced carbon leverage to the heart of our financial system. And this requires an unrelenting focus on all aspects of net zero and the transition from climate disclosure to country platforms. And that's why one of the UK's goals for COP26 was to build a financial system in which every decision takes climate change into account. And to this end, COP26 in Glasgow delivered 24 major reforms that are helping to transform the information, the tools, and the markets at the heart of finance. The foundation, as many in this room know and have worked on, the foundation of this is clear, comparable, and decision-useful climate disclosure so that all financial institutions can manage risks and seize opportunities with respect to the climate transition. And the IFRS Foundation's new International Sustainability Standards Board, launched at COP, and as well the SEC's recently released draft climate disclosure rules, are both based on the TCFD, ensuring that financial institutions will have the access to the information that they need. Now, investor demand for climate disclosure reflects the growing realization that addressing climate change is one of the greatest commercial opportunities of our time. Finance on the scale required $3 trillion per year of additional clean energy investment uh, financing uh, alone every year till 2030 is now in prospect. As part of GFANS, there's over 450 institutions from over 45 countries committed to managing their balance sheets, that $130 trillion of assets you heard about earlier, committed to, as those balance sheets turn over, managing them in line with the one and a half degree net zero transition. GFANS members are united by their commitments under the UN's Race to Zero to transition emissions uh, uh, of their finance portfolios, so the emissions of the companies they invest in or uh, lend to, uh, to net zero by 2050. But they've also committed to use science-based guidelines across all emission scopes and to set interim targets that represent their fair share of the 50% reduction that's required during this decisive uh, decade. And they will be developing net zero transition strategies and report on progress against those strategies annually. The first wave of these reports has just begun and all of the founding members of GFANS are required to have these set out by COP27 this November. In addition, GFANS is supporting the development of a new open data solution to increase the transparency and consistency across global transition, net zero transition related data. Um, this is obviously essential for all stakeholders to judge progress on the transition. Now, again, this room knows this, but I want to repeat it. Uh, the transition doesn't mean flipping a green switch or investing only in companies that themselves are already green. Transition means transition. Financial institutions must go to where the emissions are and back those companies, including those in the heavy emitting sectors like steel, cement, and transportation that have credible plans to transform their businesses for a net zero world. They will also finance traditional energy projects that are consistent with the climate transition, including critically helping to phase out stranded assets transparently and responsibly through clear frameworks. This means that while well, carbon leverage, in other words, emissions per dollar invested, will decline and must decline across the system, in some cases, it can increase for a defined period. We're committed to the imperative of real world decarbonization, not the false comfort of portfolio decarbonization. Now, we have, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, before I close on the work plan to turn uh, members' commitments into action. 
And although the work is ambitious and it's technically complex, the pace of this reform is much faster than that which followed the global financial crisis when G20 leaders managed, mandated the FSB to address the fault lines that brought the system to the verge of collapse. Our timetable is dictated by the need to get this vital work right and the imperative that we move rapidly. So over the course of the next several months, GFANS will launch a series of publications that are essential for the financial sector to build a net zero financial system, including a new globally applicable net zero transition plan framework for financial institutions, which sets out all the elements of a credible transition plan to support real world emissions reductions. Secondly, guidance on net zero committed financial sectors, uh, our expectations around the transition plans of companies, companies in the real economy, so that financial institutions have the, uh, the information they need to uh, get those emissions down. Guidance, thirdly, on decarbonization pathways for different sectors so that financial institutions can effectively set ambitious targets and actionable targets for those different sectors and assess progress. In addition, guidance on developing and using forward-looking portfolio alignment um, to reveal how well the portfolios of various financial institutions are aligning with society's goals, a framework for phasing out stranded assets I mentioned earlier, and uh, support for just energy transition partnerships, and I'll say a few more words on that in a moment. We'll publish uh, these recommendations over the course of uh, the coming few months, and given the fundamental importance of this work, um, we very much welcome engagement and feedback to these consultations from all stakeholders. And this very much includes policymakers who increasingly recognize that this work is mission critical. Um, and I want to salute uh, the UK government and the Chancellor uh, for their groundbreaking announcement at COP uh, that the UK will become the world's first net zero line financial center with new requirements for financial institutions and listed companies to publish exactly these types of transition plans. And you'll hear more about later today. And I am looking forward uh, to Commissioner McGuinness's uh, remarks tomorrow about uh, the EU's intentions in these regards. Um, look, let me move towards conclusion, but let me address a huge issue, uh, which is the financing, uh, the mobilization of capital for the transition in the emerging and developing world. And I see Secretary Kerry has joined us. And uh, John, I want to thank you on behalf of literally the world, this room and the world, for your tireless uh, efforts uh, in this regard uh, and every regard around the climate transition. Now, I'm in agreement uh, with Secretary Kerry. I'm always in agreement with Secretary Kerry, uh, but also uh, Secretary Yellen, who have uh, called for a new Bretton Woods um, to address this issue. But we all recognize the urgency, and we can't wait for a new Bretton Woods. We have to make the system we have uh, work the best it can, uh, because we have to mobilize over a trillion dollars in annual financing for these clean energy uh, transitions. Um, now, this should be possible, given the resources of GFANS, um, if we can develop a new approach uh, for mobilizing this capital. Um, and that's why we have called, and we called it COP, for new country platforms that connect blended finance at scale, high, um, high multipliers, private finance with ambitious country NDCs, channel technical assistance, and manage the wind down of stranded assets. We've developed specific proposals around this, um, and we very much welcome uh, the new JET P partnership uh, approach uh, that is being developed by the official sector and will provide all the resources uh, that are necessary for that. And uh, Hendrik, if I can salute you uh, for your leadership uh, on this, um, thank you. So to conclude, look, finance will not in and of itself drive the net zero transition. Finance is an enabler, it's a catalyst that will speed what governments and companies initiate. And we recognize that until now, the world collectively, not every part, not every company, certainly not every country, the world's been caught in a timidity trap, dithering our way 
uh, towards climate disaster. The shock of this energy crisis must prompt, prompt a comprehensive response. And if the world truly wants revolution towards a more sustainable, resilient, and fair energy system, the finance for it will be there. Thank you very much.